Oh, an error occurred. It seriously, an error occurred. Wait a moment, it. then try again. It's oh my goodness. Is. I get it. Actually, it's so funny. One time I did a panel with the, oh, we're live. <laughs> there you go. We may have been live the whole time. Well, hello, hello, and welcome to Intercultural Spark, that show about how you too can spark change in the world through your mission-driven businesses or life projects. I am your host, Deanna Shas, and if you're watching live or after the fact, thank you so much for the gift of joining us. Really appreciate that. And I hope you're inspired by today's guest to jump into action in your own sphere of influence. So today's guest teaches linguistics and other things at Columbia University. Uh, he's written over 20, yes, 20 books, including the one that is the inspiration for today's show, which is Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now, and Forever. He hosts the podcast, Lexicon Valley. He writes for The Atlantic, and he's one of the newest essayists for The New York Times. Welcome to the show, John McWhorter. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Deanna. How are you? So I had to do a quick change. I told John I had to wear my inner voice shirt. Uh, because, because as I was preparing to do this, because there may be cussing on the show, my inner voice kept saying, you're not allowed to cuss in public. So rather than having my inner voice on the side, like coaching me or telling me what I can and can't do, I just, I brought my inner voice with me to the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what that's about. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone who's watching live. If you are watching live, please know that we'd love for you to say hello and ask questions in the comments because we'll be able to share those on screen and, and have you join us. So, uh, John, thank you for being here. Of course. Happy to be here. Thank you. So, John, as a linguist, language is your business, and you've written other books on English as well through different lenses, like, you know, talking back, talking blank, black or the language hoax, why the world looks the same in any language. So my question for you is, do you cuss a lot in real life or how does one decide to write a book about cursing? Well, you know, I decided to write the book about cursing because I was thinking I like to share my toys and it's getting harder and harder to write a book that anybody has any reason to pay any attention to because we're all doing these podcasts, including me. So I thought if I do a book, it has to be one where there's kind of a hook. And I figured mm -hmm. with language, there are really two things. One of them is language in the internet. Somebody wrote that a couple of years ago, so mm -hmm. can't write that one. Then I thought people want to know about cursing. And I thought, you know, you can go curse by curse and people will learn a lot about linguistics and also have a good time. And as to whether I curse, the truth is, yeah. And so a big theme in the book is that when I think about how much I use those classic four letter words, I use them more than my parents did. And more to the point, I'm kind of a reserved, starchy person. And so it's not that I'm somebody who likes to let it all hang out. I was thinking I'm normal. I'm 55 and I'm normal in how often I use those words. I think what profanity is has changed. So that ended up giving the book a theme instead of just being a list. Mm -hmm. Well, and along that day, when you talk about a theme, so I was mentioning, I just did a drive from St. Louis to Chicago. I was coming back from visiting my family and got the audible version of the book. And so I listened to it. I mean, it's a theme and you could just kind of say, here's the words. Everyone knows George Carlin's, you know, the, the, what is it? The seven, the seven words you can't say. You can't say, right. So my question for you though, is like, I know you're a linguist, but you go deep. Like, how do you find out that the first F-bomb was dropped in, what was it, 1523? Like, <laughs> you had actual conversations with Cole Porter. And I'm going to drop it. I'm going to say it like John LaFucker, who lived in the 13th century. <laughs> like, how do you go that deep and find all of this? You know, I should admit it, but half of it is <laughs> you do the Oxford English Dictionary, and a lot of it is there. And then the rest of it is that there are people who research these things, and you just read what everybody says. No one person usually tells the whole story, but you start to collate. And then some of it is just that I'm crazy. And for example, <laughs> I'm into Cole Porter. And so I found a lot 
lot of it is that I've probably seen too many obscure old movies. I've read too many strange mm -hmm. old books. And you just think to yourself, here's something that wasn't in the Oxford English Dictionary. And next thing you know, you have by accident the whole story of fuck. But it took collating a whole lot of things. Wait, and I just blushed on cue. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. To tell you the truth, Dan, originally I wanted it to be a book about just that word. And yeah. then I realized nobody wants to read 200 pages about that. And so then I stretched it out into the other ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, so along those lines, um, so you stretched it out. There's a few recurring themes. There's things, and I loved this one because, of course, anyone who's a parent talks to your children about the whole idea of whether or not you're allowed to curse. And it's very clear that a lot of curse words, it's social constructs. Like who decided, you know, that red is okay, but shit is not. So talk about that. And you use your, your own kids as examples. Like how does that play in the house? What happens when the kids cuss? And what did they think? Did they Have they heard the audible version of your book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, to tell you the truth, I think some people would be a little bit disturbed by what I allow to go on in the house. But the truth is, kids don't just learn the word red. They know what the words sociological significations are. So my kids who are six and nine at this point, they know that there's certain words that are kind of like the liquor, like they're not supposed to mm -hmm. use them or they use them in quotation marks. And so my six year old, frankly, pops off with those words as a joke in quotation marks with a wink, knowing mm -hmm. that she's not supposed to. That's her way of pushing the envelope. And I don't mind because I figure that those words now are used so often by me, she gets them from me, that I can't make the claim the way my mother did. I said hell once in 1970 and she washed my mouth out with soap. But she mm -hmm. and my father said it all the time. I don't want to, re even though that was what people did back then, I don't want to recapitulate that. So I just figure that they know that there's certain words that you do not use until you're a certain age and they don't walk around using them mm -hmm. casually. But I figure they can hear me saying them and, and they think it's funny and they are for us salty. And as you know, another theme of the book is that our real profanity are more serious words than, you know, F-U-C-K, et cetera. But yeah, I, I use them. I do not hold back on certain words in mm -hmm. the house. It's the real profanity that I don't use in the house. Yeah. And Brianna says her mom won't even say hell. And actually I had to point out to um, Brianna, she said, la fucker. I point out that he was French <laughs> and it's la fucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Well, so along those lines, why don't we hold off? Because you actually you do. Well, I guess you went there. Let's go ahead and go there. When you talk about the words that you picked and what makes a word profanity, I think one of the things you're talking about is you. There's a whole chapter on the N word in the exactly. book as yeah. profanity. How did you define profanity that ended up including that word? It really just came down to, you know, you're writing this book and you, you've got your list of words mm -hmm. and you go damn and hell, which are no longer really profane. Then the next mm -hmm. one that I'm not going to say them over and over because some people think of them as profane, but those words. Mm -hmm. And sure. then I kind of thought I'm not being honest. You know, frankly, it stopped at it stopped at Dick. And then I kind of thought this isn't the end of it. How is it that I say F-U-C-K so much around my children and think nothing mm -hmm. of it? And yet. I do feel like there's profanity. And I realize, you know, profanity is the N word. There's a word used to refer to gay men. There's a word that mm -hmm. I have never said to, or even I think only once did I even use it in reference to a woman that begins with C. It's just an utterly poisonous word. And I thought- That chapter I, was hard to, to even listen to. You're hearing, you're like, that's like one, like all the words people use. But when you got to that chapter, I was like, Oh, you're really not supposed to say that word. That chapter <laughs> was a nightmare to record. Uh -huh. While I was recording it, and of course the proctor was a woman, I said, I feel so awkward saying this over and over that I'm going to pull out some of them. I euphemized more during the reading because it was just impossible. I oh, thought, how am I going to sound? But you know, writing the chapter, I thought the fact that I feel that way about it means that that's the profanity as opposed mm -hmm. to 100 years ago when, frankly, fuck was how, that word. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought this book needs to be about the real profanity, too. And that means the N-word. And to be honest, I've written about the N-word here and there before. And I kind of thought, oh, God, this again. And I kind of worried mm -hmm. that that would suck away all the attention in the book from everything else because I'm black myself. But I couldn't not include it. And so mm -hmm. that's I figured the third then the third part of this book is about profanity for real, which mm -hmm. I would never utter in my house. And if I heard one of my kids using one of these words, I'd want to mm -hmm. either go into sure. therapy or send them into it. And so we're just in a different period at this point. 
Mm -hmm. Well, it was interesting, and I'll use the one that women use, um, because I actually even in my, I did a final reminder post for today's show, and I was like, hey, bitches, come on over to the show. And no, I, of course, I wasn't telling people to ask their pets to watch the show today. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so talk a little bit about that. When you talked about the evolution of the language, you talked a lot about how it went from like being, being a bodily function to a noun, to a verb, to a pronoun, to a term of affection. It's the most amazing thing. And it's interesting with the word that you just mentioned, I almost mm -hmm. considered not including it in the book because once I got to the women terms, I thought I'm this middle-aged man writing about this, how's it gonna come off? But the thing is that word, the bitch, mm -hmm. ends up being used as a pronoun in really up-to-date English. And that mm -hmm. happens to a lot of these words. If you say, I'm gonna fire his ass, you mm -hmm. obviously don't mean anything about his buttocks. You mean him. It's just right, his, his whole being, flavor, his whole his whole <laughs> being. And the funny thing is, if people will pardon me, somebody might say these days, a bitch is scared. And that's a person describing themselves. A bitch mm -hmm. is scared. It's cold out there or talking about the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that, mean, that means I. And so although it sounds like it's just profanity or it's just slang to a linguist, that is the development of new grammar. And I just found it fascinating. People also use the N word in that mm -hmm. way. I didn't know about that use of the B word until I wrote this and somebody told me, and then I started hearing it around. But oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting about that, actually, there was a time that I'm going to, Rihanna has a question for us, but this was years ago, um, new management took over the lakefront region of the Chicago Park District. And there were four of us, we were all women who were like doing the marketing, the HR, the, the um, legal counsel. And we found out through the grapevine that, that people, like people who you know, recognize there was a new guard. They nicknamed, nicknamed us the bitches of the beach. Yeah. <laughs> we loved it. Are you kidding me? We were like so proud of that. We're like, yeah, all right. It's been reclaimed, exactly. Yeah, I mean, of course, sure. I'm not going to use it, but yes, it can be used in a way that marks pride, exactly. Mm, sure. So Brianna's asking, you've talked a little bit how profanity changes over time with the meaning we assign to it, but are there, oh, you have a great quote. You're going to say it better than I did, but kind of when, when cussing changed from being about the church to being about bodily functions. So mm -hmm. talk about that, but yeah. So how do words become less bad over time? One quote, and I forgot I wrote it till somebody told me a couple of weeks ago is when profanity went from being about the holy to being about the holes. And I did, I, I did write that, that. quote. And so it starts now <laughs> as being about God. And then it's not, you know, we put OMG on a t-shirt, then it becomes about excretion and sex. Mm -hmm. And now it's about slurring other people, which I think is in a way mm -hmm. more sophisticated than it being about the holes mm -hmm. in particular. But a lot of it is that things get weaker. And so for example, if you look at cursing, there's what's in the dictionary, but then there's what you really say. Mm -hmm. And so you can, and pardon me folks, just, just for illustration, you can say shit, but then notice that there's bullshit and horse shit, which just makes it stronger. You could call somebody a fucker and you could until about 1960. Notice that it's really more idiomatic to call somebody a motherfucker, which makes no sense. It just gives it some snap that the word had lost. So the thing is surprise, you know, a joke wears off, a curse wears off. One more. What the hell is this? Okay. What the fuck is this? That's me because what the hell is too light? Somebody 25, what the shit is this? Because it's different. You keep on renewing these sorts of things. So a lot of it is that, that you want it to have the punch that it used to have. And so these things get renewed. Mm -hmm. So something interesting about that, when we, uh, and, and I did warn people that there would be cussing on this show, but it's completely in context. <laughs> so, um, so I named the show this idea of uh, whether language makes you look old. And the reason I did that, I'm getting a little echo on my end. I don't know if you're hearing it on, there it goes. No. Um, okay, good. Uh, so the reason I named it that, this is so funny. When I named the show, I had only read the introduction and you were going through all the archaic things of like golly gee willikers and this or that. And basically, John, basically it was my vernacular. Basically it was like everything I say every day. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where I was late for going to teach fitness and I couldn't find my keys. And I walk into the kitchen and I'm going to drop the F-bomb for effect. I was looking for my keys. I'm like, golly gee, fucking Willikers. And my son stops and he goes, you need to talk to John about that on Thursday. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> You're mixing so them up. 
<laughs> oh my God. So one, I'm mixing them up. Two, I'm realizing I'm showing my age. Plus I didn't even know, I've never heard someone say, what the shit is this? And I have to tell you, so here's, please tell us your secret because when I'm listening to the book, you evolve over the generations so well. And when you say this stuff, you sound authentic. Like I say the new stuff and I sound like an old person trying to sound hip. How do you learn new things and then say them so naturally? What an interesting question. Um, I think many people, given what my media persona often is, would be surprised mm -hmm. is that I'm kind of a mimic. I, mm -hmm. I've been told that since I was five or six, I like imitating other people. And so if I hear it, I have a spontaneous desire to try to sound like it, you know, even sometimes with, if it's a woman where, you know, my voice doesn't match it, but also I'm always listening. And so mm -hmm. I walk down the street and just like people, people watch, I guess I people listen. And so for example, I remember while I was writing the, the B word chapter, I saw some teenagers and there was a woman and there was well, a girl and a boy and a boy. And then mm -hmm. a girl walks up to them and she says, Hey bitches. And I remember thinking, actually two of them are guys. And so I was thinking this really is even becoming gender neutral. It's this friendly way of saying hello. Oh, interesting, friends, sure. Professionals. Now I guess somebody somebody might wonder why was I listening? You know, I guess I should have been you know, looking at my phone, but I'm always listening to what the kids are saying. And also if you teach at a university, just you're walking down mm, the street. My sure. office used to be on a major kind of thoroughfare where I would just hear people saying things. And then if people know that you're interested, your students will start telling you. You know, I'll say, what's that mm -hmm. word you used, Rebecca? And then there'll be this whole conversation about here's some things that we're saying. So they help me with a lot of it too. So it's just being a little, having a weird ear. That's what, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. And your kids, if you use things that they do, they go, do they act like, ah, oh, dad, stop it. That's or do they just encourage starting it? with the nine-year-old that she okay. has a little thing she says, especially over Zoom over the past year because of the you know what. And then I'll say something in the background like them. And I can mm -hmm. tell that it's already dad's not cool enough to say that. Yeah, that's that's happening. Mm -hmm. So my new answer to who would you want to hang out with from history? My new answer is Lucille Bogan. Like you <laughs> reference her a number of times, like a lot of the times when language was pushed to the limits mm -hmm. and then new things got into public, you know, the public lexicon, it was because she did it. Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about her? Like I'm fascinated by her. Oh, Lucille Bogan is interesting. And I should say that mm -hmm. that comes to me from a student. It was a student who heard me talking about profanity in a class about 10 years ago who dug this up. So that's an example. Lucille Bogan wow. was a, um, a black blues singer. It's mm -hmm. said that she was sort of third after Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey. I don't know if that was true, but she was a, a working blues singer. Mm -hmm. And she happened to make this party record in 1935 and it survives in pristine condition. There are actually a few sides where she just curses like a sailor through this whole song and the guys in the background are laughing and she breaks out laughing sometimes. And it just shows you that in 1935, these are people who, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have penicillin, they don't have television, 1935, Practically every word in the book that I wrote, Within Reason, is in it. And it just shows you that our sense partly that everything is so dirty now is just because media didn't record the way a lot of people really talked. And so nowadays you can just go online and find Lucille Bogan. I'll bet that book has upped her hits, but you can listen to this person <laughs> using all the words that we're using and more of them. And it's quite clear that it's not new to her and that mm. this is just a way of listening to the real world of 1935 that otherwise is lost to us because the people are all dead and nobody was recording things like that for commercial use. Fascinating yeah. source of how these things actually go. And it yeah. also, I think I'm going to leave out the detail, but it taught, it can teach you something about how people refer to parts of the anatomy and how what you thought was only used to refer to a man can also be used to refer to a woman. I'll just leave it there, but you can hear her talking about such things well, in, in these lyrics. Well, what's interesting though, when you talk about when this was, and you go way back, I mean, like down to like the first the time yeah, like all the way down to, I don't know what, like fifth century BC or something. I mean, you got everything. <laughs> and what I found, which actually, what, sorry, as, as 
I, I'm totally impressed by that because can you imagine like a, a you know a, a, even a college student being like I'm going to write about cursing and people like no you just want to gratuitously cuss. I just want to vouch <laughs> for everyone who reads this book. Like actually, it's almost like the cussing. The cussing was like well I had to do it because the research and the intellectual approach that you take is so deep that Thank you realize you. no this is like a really intellectual process. What I found really interesting is that a lot of the cussing back in the earlier days was really matter of fact, and that it sounds like we're like in this rebirth of Puritanism, that it's current people, it's current generations that are all hung up about cussing. Yeah, that's an interesting way of, of thinking about it. And I think with it acknowledged that people back in the day cursed more than we often can tell, and that even people who were very elderly today are often under-reporting how much they cursed or how much people yeah. cursed around them. Because who remembers exactly what anybody was saying around them when they were 15? If you think about it, can you play back the conversation like a tape recorder? So people have a way of idealizing. But still, I think that it's all about the same. It's just that today, what we think of the way older people thought of cursing, we think of as something else. We call them slurs. And so we think, well, that's not profanity. Mm -hmm. But then again, we call tomatoes vegetables when they're really fruits. We all know what the, the truth is. And to the extent that, you know, they ran an excerpt of my N-word chapter in mm. the New York Times, and they did it by having a whole preface where they had a whole discussion about the fact that they actually spelled out the word with the idea being that it's partly that I'm black myself. And so mm -hmm. it, it, they can but do he, it. But they had, had to do whole, that. And I'll just kind of, that. Um, no, I did not write that. And to be honest, I've never even actually read it, but I know that they did put that mm -hmm. on there. No, and but in your book, in your ahead. book, sorry, I'm totally cutting you off, but I was impressed Please. by that in your own book. When you got to that chapter, you have a whole introduction True. that explains why you're going to use that word, how you're using it. Like, like there's a lot right there to frame it before you go into it. Yeah, because yeah, you're absolutely right. Because of what I knew the reader response would be. I mean, the funny mm -hmm. thing is we're at a point today and there are all sorts of perspectives you can take on it. A white person couldn't have written the chapter. It's right. at that point. That was not, not true, say, as recently as 25 years ago. But I thought, I am not going to write this saying the N-word 150 times. Nobody mm -hmm. would. But I thought, I am going to take the liberty of writing the real word. But I was thinking if I were white, I just couldn't include the chapter. And so right. that means that we have taboo. And mm -hmm. back sure. in the day, there were people who had taboo with these other words. We are just like them. It's just that it's about different, different, different stuff. words. And yeah. I just find that interesting. And some things don't change as much as we think. Sure. So I love it. Jay says, this is a great fucking episode. Bravo. <laughs> so, um, Stephanie, and hi, Jay. Hi, Stephanie. Um, how do you think gender identity plays a role with profanity? Well, you know, what's interesting about gender identity is that to the extent that we're not as rigid about that kind of thing as we used to be, we're going to see fewer splits. And so whatever profanity comes along isn't necessarily only going to refer to men or only refer to women. And a beautiful example was that teenage girl calling, you know, her friends, you know, boy, boy, girl, hello, bitches. And that wasn't mm -hmm. even supposed to be funny. I think we're going to see more of that sort of thing. It's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Asshole mm -hmm. means a guy who cuts you off in traffic. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, <laughs> that B word is a woman who cuts you off in traffic. It's the same thing, except it's coded for a woman. That kind of split, I think, is going to be less common as mm -hmm. we open up to the idea that mm -hmm. we don't have to have these binaries. That's a guess that I have. Oh, right. If we have more gender fluidity in, yeah. just in society. You know, yeah. one thing that I do want to make sure that when we talk about the intellectual depth of your book, and as someone who speaks a few languages, I love the whole intersection of culture <laughs> and language. Um, you went through a whole thing. It's like, well, we might say, you know, you know, uh, you know, you got a shitload of stuff here. But if you were in Russia, you'd say this like, oh, and Scots, what's your connection with Scots? You give a lot of Scottish examples as well. That's, it's only <laughs> just that there's something profane about those hmm. Scots in that when you look at the first usages of certain words, for some reason, it always pops up in written Scots. 
So maybe mm-hmm. there were people speaking Old English. I am convinced, for example, I say in the book, that there would have been a verb fukan in mm-hmm. Old English that meant that. No one ever wrote it down. I can feel in my bones it existed. But the Scots, for some reason, start writing that in the 1400s. And so you get the fukit. And so you, if you <laughs> want to know that it exists, you have to read this obscure Scottish poetry. It's not something I have any particular interest in, but that is where you get the first evidence for some reason. And with Russian, it was just because I love it, and I, there's all there are a lot of sources about Russian profanity, and it's very rich. I mean, just listening to what they do with a certain three words is dazzling. And so I thought I wanted to get that in there to show that English isn't as odd as we might think in terms of how it does its profanity. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, one thing for our viewers, if this is helpful for those of us, like I've got my inner voice with me today. I was with a client yesterday and the word, there was a word, a curse word that fit into conversation. I literally, I had your book in my backpack. So at first mm-hmm. I said, boy, you did a lot of work on that. And then I pulled, so for anyone else, get the book, you can do this. I pulled it out of my backpack and I said, actually the real word, if I was going to use it, which John says, the real word is that was a shitload of work. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then I put the book back in and the we real word going. yeah <laughs> and then i wondered if that was the right one if there was another version you know another second part of that so <laughs> um real to me <laughs> yeah so we're actually i cannot believe it we are already at the point oh and we didn't even talk about show tune yet um let's do our exercise <laughs> of the day and then right before we close maybe you'll sing a show tune i want to know about the new york times but every time because people learn differently i always like to do kinetic learning on the show which is the interpretive exercise of the day so i'm going to make myself full screen for a second and then i'll pull you back on i hope you'll do the exercise with me and then you can tell me if you know why this exercise is indicative of what we're doing. All right, I'll try. Okay, all right, so here we go. And for those of you at home, you can do this just in your chair. I hope you'll do it with us. Um, This exercise is for your rotator cuff. So I want you to bring your arms up. Your elbows are like half an inch below shoulder height, half an inch in front. You can just make a fist with your hands. Keep your um, shoulder to elbow at shoulder height Oops, as you come all the way down and then back up. So that is a rotator cuff exercise. Let's bring John back on and see if he can do that with me. Um, Okay, so right here, actually, we'll put us both this way so that we can- uh, That feels good. Okay, well, that's because your rotator cuffs get really tight a lot, so it's a great stretch. So I'm glad Hmm. that it feels good. Do you have any idea why that exercise, why that would be the exercise we would do for your episode today? Heavy lifting, twist and shout. Um, I feel good, but see, none of these are show tunes. <laughs> okay, kind of me. so I think I, I I tricked you with the show tune reference. This is actually a reference to a joke that my younger sister Kara likes to tell. So here's why this is indicative. This is Kara's oldest joke. So now try it again with with fingers, and you go down, and I say, John, can you hear this? And you say, no, because you can't hear anything. No. I said, well, let me turn it up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have thought of that. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm glad you're laughing because I am trying not to be the one laughing at my jokes. But that's why I thought that was a good exercise. And like you said, it feels good. It's really it's really it a good You're supposed good to do exercise. it 12 times or something? Yeah, 12 times, depending on who's behind you, right? <laughs> 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 oh my gosh, this has been so much fun. Before we go, tell us, so so this is brand new. I was going to talk about a newsletter that you had been doing. And now, mm-hmm. is this like since last week, you're now writing twice a week, a newsletter, an essayist for the New York Times. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us about that and how people can subscribe to that. Well, that happened um, kind of out of the blue. I Mm -hmm. frankly didn't expect for many reasons that the Times would ever want my regular contributions. But apparently now I'm doing an essay a couple of times a week. They're starting a subscriber only newsletter section. And that's not as exclusive as it sounds, because I would venture that most people who read the Times every day subscribe. But the Mm -hmm. idea is that you subscribe and then you get to read me going on about something for 1500 words every three days. It's sometimes language. Sometimes it'll be about race. Sometimes it'll just be about 
the arts and why I have signed up for this. I'm not completely sure, but as if I, you know, had so much spare time. But yes, I've been having fun so far. I just wrote the the fourth one today, come to think of it. And so, yeah, come see me at my my newsletter for subscribers only, which is probably most of you. Yeah. Mm, sure. And they can also follow you on Twitter. They can they find can. your podcast. And I love actually the fact that once you and I start cussing, that gives everyone else freedom to do it. Uh, Brianna, uh, <laughs> the essay about woke becoming <laughs> Thank an you, info. Brianna was fantastic. <laughs> I like the holy crap that was fun. Nancy <laughs> beat <laughs> the y'all bitches. bitches. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. <laughs> oh, so thank you so much um for everyone. I appreciate everyone joining live. We are here every Thursday. Hope you'll join us again for your lunchtime. And uh John, thanks for taking the time to spend with us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Deanna. <laughs>